afternoon. Okay, gonna let you all hop in here and real quick why you are. I am Skylar with Lean Frontiers and on the screen today you do see John and Oscar. They will be taking over this webinar for you. Um, just a quick reminder again that the TWI and CADA Summit will be in March, so right around the corner. And that is all I have. Oscar, on to you. Thanks, Skylar. And again, as I said with yesterday, it's much appreciate your work behind the scenes in putting these together. Um, one point is that John, that we're about to hear from, was asked, uh, or we can we looked at um, having John present at this year's TWI Summit, and he was otherwise engaged, which is fine. But I know it's a long way ahead, but he will be there at the 2024 one. That's the plan, at least. So, John, thanks again for giving us your time, as you do. There's a couple of questions come through, and we need to probably go back to the one we did six months ago and reflect a little bit there. John Murley has stated he's interested in hearing more about the people-centred approach. So can you just put up that slide you had six months ago and give us some background on that, please? Sure. Okay, so it, okay, it's popped up. Um, yep, so beautiful. In the um, approach to try to develop a plan for leadership here um, to develop the skills that leaders need, um, I, I had tried to get a, I'm a visual thinker, so I had to try to get a model built that made sense to me that, um, you know, would would allow us to kind of scale this um, through throughout leaders at every level in the company. And and as I looked at it, there's, you know, there's a pattern um, or kata, if you want to call it, for each one of those key areas. And um, it kept coming back to me that really uh, people need to be in the center of that because, you know, that's you get results through your people. And any, every one of these things is uh, the other patterns are really just um, ways to solve either a problem or, you know, do an improvement or improve in an area. Um, so, and then the coaching was around the outside to make sure that all those patterns are coached into the, the people in the center and, and then you build those skills. So that was the, the, you know, the two minute synopsis of what, you know, the model and how it came about. No, it's good. Just to, as a reflection, John, because what in the Institute, we get asked a lot, where should we start? Um, when we're when you when people are wanting to head down a path like you've headed down. Now, what I find interesting there is you've got job relations in the centre, but I know you didn't start with job relations. Uh, um, you started with well, I think you started with the scientific thinking pattern, Toyota Carter. But if but on reflection, if you were to look back, <clears throat> would you do that again, or would you alter the the order of what you've done? And look. One thing to make clear to everyone, don't copy what John said because it says about to say, because I think this is a case by case, but I'm interested in your thoughts on that, John. Sure. Um, so in reflection, I would say, I think when I built this model, I, I would have started with job relations versus the scientific thinking. But since since we, you know, six months ago, we were talking about this, I would actually revert back to starting with scientific thinking because we have seen a lot of movement now and a lot of momentum starting by pulling the proper tool or skill into, you know, into the area needed. So for instance, if they're having the obstacle in front of them as people issues, then yeah. you'd pull job relations in to learn, you know, to, to, to deal with that obstacle. And so I still think, uh, you know, I think now I'm, I'm full circle on it. I would go with still the scientific thinking model first or pattern first so that they can use that to, to, to pull in the tools needed instead of just applying it as a, you know, maybe, a, I guess, put a square peg in a round hole or use a hammer where you need a, a wrench, you know, type of thing. Yeah, yeah, good. And I think that makes, I think I understand where you're coming from because one of the things, now you've said it, one of the things I often say is that job relations is scientific thinking for people. Yeah. And job instruction is a scientific thinking pattern applied to training. And job methods is very obviously, when you look at it and practice it, you can see the scientific thinking in that. So that's what you're getting at, is it? Is it, it yeah. underpins all of these things you have there? Yeah, correct. And then you also have the coaching that's added in that, um, you know, in the in the Toyota Kata approach that we, when we learned that, um, the coaching was really a key aspect too, that you have that coaching building because you need coaching in each one of those 
areas as well. So the scientific yes. thinking is embedded in each one of the patterns, but the coaching can be universal and make sure that you're, you know, you're helping people achieve the skills first and then help them, you know, practice the, um, whichever pattern they need to follow. Sure. And what I've also, and actually I'm talking about this at the summit in, in uh, March, is that you can apply scientific thinking, or you should apply, there's a big opportunity to apply scientific thinking to the, to the development of people. Absolutely. Uh, do you want to, uh, do you want to, have you looked at it from that view and would you be able to comment on that? Yeah, it's actually funny you bring that up, Oscar, because we, one of the, one of the big hurdles we had during the pandemic, and we still feel it with the staff shortages, we've had the, we haven't had the ability to actually formally have any of these, um, you know, trainings for job relations or for problem solving or any of these other things. We've really just focused on the improvement kata and coaching kata. And then um, as we did that, we learned that there's a lot of skills people need just to just to practice that, um, you know, to practice that in their area. So for instance, they may need help gathering data or they may need help communicating with the people on their in their area. So we've we've really identified obstacles and used scientific thinking to kind of identify the obstacles in that people development. And we we attack it with whatever means necessary, whether it be a coaching training or, you know, or people training or however we want to go about it. But it's much less formal because we're actually attacking uh, something you brought up, Oscar, when you we did the 40 hour was um, no recreational improvement, right? You want to make sure you're solving what's yeah. in front of you that's preventing you from getting to your goal. So whether yeah. it's a people issue or, um, you know, a methods issue or, or a CI issue, you're, you're pull the, you know, pull it in to solve the, the obstacle in front of you. Yeah, just for everyone's benefit, John mentioned their recreational improvement. What we talked about in the 40 hour a few years ago was, you know, recreational improvement is it's no direct, has no direction. We're doing it for, for the, we're doing it for the sake of it with, with no direction, heading here, there and everywhere, as opposed to, um, so as, as, as opposed to scientific thinking based improvement, which has direction and has very, very clear intent driven by a goal. Um, you might want to comment because it sort of come up naturally. Paul Broadbent has asked any key points for the introduction of any of this stuff, Carter in particular, into a business where CI has been on pause during COVID times. I guess the first question there is, to what degree did this go on pause in during COVID times? <clears throat> well, our it did go on pause and we ended up having to um, do some remote training. Sam, you know, Sam uh, did some kata training with a different group and it it really was tough because with all the remote nature of all the resources not being in front of, you know, in the same room almost, it was difficult. Um, I think the biggest mistake or I think the biggest learning we had was that I we, like that. I like that correction you just made then, John. <laughs> thank you. The um, was that you need to take a step. And I think you could think if you just you don't try to perfect the, the, the plan and get it in place and make it beautiful because everything's so dynamic even now with you know with what with supply chains you know struggles and, and people struggles at least here um if you wait for things to settle down you're never going to move forward so just take a step and i think that's also the scientific thinking approach it doesn't you're going to learn from it either way even if it doesn't happen the way you expect it to you know your experiment is your experiment so if your experiment is setting up a ci system then just start with one thing and and i suggest you know it's universal is the improvement kind of mindset because you're pulling in what you need but start wherever you want but just take a step and then correct course correct along the way um and don't try to you know try to avoid recreational improvement because that's what we were finding that we we were we weren't as focused until we really got to it what really changed things was getting it pushed out to the floor um, and at the grassroots level, it's now started really powerfully moving. They're, they're solving their own issues. They're raising, they're setting their own challenges um, in their areas based on the company's goals. And it's really started to, um, it's nice to see. And I've been pulled further back. I'm less involved. All I'm helping people with is coaching training. How do they, how to talk to people, how to coach, how to not give advice, but still, you know, still support them. Um, I guess that's a... A big answer, but that's what I would say. 
Yeah, and I, I think it's it. we had an interesting thing with our business, with what we do, is for two years, you know, we were a little bit light on with work. Not too bad, but a little bit light on, um, but not too bad. We were lucky. Uh, but around March this year or April, it just came in and we got, we're, we're not swamped, but we're not far off it at the moment. And I think it was interesting. I think people, th those who are committed suddenly realise we can't sit in a holding pattern any longer. <laughs> that it, it is it is what it is. And now we have to bring the plane into land. And that's what they did. And they did it all at the same time, which wasn't, wasn't too good. All within a month that was interesting. You could almost see the mindset change. And I think yeah. what you said is important. You realise life goes on. You have to keep going as a business. But it, but what I think you covered really well was how do I how do you keep going step by step with a goal in mind? Yeah, yeah. I think you know you you can start to build a big project plan on how you're going to roll it out, and then you'll never have the resources. So just start, and it will it will self. I know if you, the tipping point concept, right, of getting just enough people practicing it, you'll start to course correct along the way. And you'll you'll find out that whatever path you were going to take probably wasn't the perfect one anyway. So just take a step. Yes, exactly. I'm working with a company at the moment who are really struggling. I spoke to them about this a lot yesterday, was they're trying to predict a path into the unknown. Yeah. And by nature, that's not, you can't. Right. It's, exactly. You're going if you try and do that, and then they end up in you know they end up in arguments about who's got the right path. <laughs> We're never going to get anywhere with this guys. Yeah. It's um. It's exactly it's right. It's just not possible. Yeah, I agree. That the the trap of falling into thinking you know beyond your knowledge threshold, like you you know we talked about again in that training, mm -hmm. is evident. Right. If you think you know, then yeah, you can plan to that to that wall but beyond that you can't make a plan you have to react to the next step you take so uh, the other thing i find interesting about this and i don't know if i said it in the 40 hour it came up um i've heard mike Roder say it to me about four or five years ago there's when you think about it when you write a project plan you're writing it from the maximum point of uncertainty yeah and that doesn't really make sense yeah no it doesn't doesn't when uh, you stop so you need to have a course and a pattern to follow to 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 find your way rather than plan your way as such. That's quite a it was a hell of a mind shift for me. Yeah. You um you mentioned about uh how it's started to gain its main momentum now. It's less of you pushing. Was it something that particular that happened that uh, that you saw that a change, or has that just been a gradual? Was it just been gradual? Uh, I think there's a couple things that that, that uh, really um, affected the the pace at which things started to catch on. One was um, when the coaches that were trained that went through the training during the pandemic, when they started to understand their job wasn't to um, was that the Carter training or one of these others? It was I'm sorry, the Carter, the Carter training. The, yeah, the coaching yes. Carter, that improvement Carter training. Um, the coach learned. And finally realize that their job isn't to get people to their challenge, it's to make sure people are building the skill through following the pattern. So once they realize that their goal is to make sure that person follows the pattern to develop the skill, that actually became their challenge. And once yes. that started to happen, then they would let go and step back and let the group follow the pattern and actually chart their own course. That started to build that accountability and that, and, you know, that energy um, and you could see it in the in just in the dynamics of the people. They're so en enthused about having a say or control over how to improve their area. Second thing was we really had to put a big focus. This is something we learned, and it may not be the same with everybody, but I'll share it in case, is you you, you have to focus the learners on what's in their control. So all the obstacles that come up in manufacturing, you could have a maintenance issues on machines. You could have other things where people can't help them today because they may have juggling priorities. So we had to re-engage um, re, re the coach to make sure that they're attacking obstacles they're in control of first. When you've cleaned all those up, then you then and, and the real obstacle in front of you is maintenance, then we'll take care of that. But you can't let the, the, the uh, momentum die because you, you want to point to something you're not in control of. And so we made them focus on areas that were things that they could control and that really helped with the momentum of the cycles of experimentation too yeah right 
So that would have presumably meant focusing on the smaller steps rather than the big chunks of buying a new bit of gear or, you know, whatever yeah. that may be. Yeah. If that's what you're getting at. Yeah, I think it's easy for people to point to something they don't control so so they can feel good. Okay, well, that's block C. That's why it's not yeah. fixed yet. So we had to get that mindset switched. And, and they switched it on. We didn't change anything. We changed our approach and we forced them down a path to look at, identify the obstacles that they can control. And it naturally led to smaller incremental uh, experiments yeah. and, and more wins, actually, more more movement toward their target conditions and their goals. So that was yeah. uh, really, really important. Brilliant. Uh, one thing on that is that often, and I'd like you to reflect on the, the middle level of management that you have, I often say to people at that level, you know, if you can get good at this, it's actually completely liberating. Yeah. Because you don't long, you no longer plot the course. You just plot the way people think. They will find their way. So no longer do you have, no more do you have to come up with the answer. You're not the answer person anymore. Yeah. Did you, is that part of what you, did you, did you see that reaction in anyone? Oh, actually my job has actually become easier when I don't have to plot the course for others. Yeah, I think um, I've been personally sitting down with our middle management group doing coaching training with a book that's called The Coaching Habit, which is, I don't know if you've, you're familiar with that book. It's by Michael Bunge right. Senior. That's a great, great, easy to learn. And it follows a very similar mindset with questions like the coaching, uh, the coaching kata, but there are seven questions and they're all about making sure you're not, you're engaging that person's mind and you're pulling them in. So there's, it's a little different, but it's easy. It was easier for that group to understand and to let go. And what, what I found is through that, along with the improvement kata that they've got going in the coaching, that approach has helped them understand that there's is a liberation to that. Like there you, and you can scale your improvements. Like you're only one person. So I'm an excellent problem solver. That's how I got to where I am, but I can only solve one problem at a time. And if I have yeah, 10 yeah. people out there doing the same thing, I've now scaled that by 10 and then they do yeah. that again. And it's, you know, that's when the real power, you know, and the exponential improvement starts to happen. So, yeah, sure. Interesting. And the other, but the other side of that coin, and I'll be, and I don't want you to name names, obviously, but I'll be interested to know the other side of that coin is I've seen middle level leaders who have built their career or their job around giving people the answer. So if you suddenly put that in front of them, that that's not the job anymore. The job is to develop people thinking the way people are thinking. I've had I've had middle managers really push back against that and feel really threatened by letting go. Did you experience that at all? Absolutely. Um, I personally did myself a little bit when I first started with trying to think about scaling that down because a lot of your value that you place on yourself is the ability to give answers and solve problems. The bigger piece that we had a struggle with was actually not push back in a negative way. They just felt like um, they 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 love helping people and they hate seeing people struggle. So uh -huh. it's easier for them to provide the answer and not you know not have that person struggle. And we use the parable about you know teach a person to fish, you feed them for life. You know if you give them a fish, you feed them for the day. Well, that's the same mindset, right? You got to teach them to go fish for themselves, and then. There's, and that they did start to find that liberating. I still wouldn't say we're past that. Um, I think no. there's a lot of people that still passive aggressive approach a little bit, but they're, I think the ones who are where the, where the momentum's really happening, they're further along their journey and they're, they see that a hundred percent. It frees them up to do things that they're uniquely qualified or, you know, uniquely qualified to do. So they're not solving work level problems where the experts can solve the, you know, the worker that works on that machine is the expert let them solve you know the issues that yes. are in front of them so where you have had that pushback because of the issue that i was talking about how have you needed to handle that front on or in any cases or have you just allowed it to take its course actually in the training sessions that i've been doing it's actually just a book read we're not it's not really training we're just reading the book chapter by chapter and what we do is have a round table discussion on what did you get out of that? How does it apply? And it naturally has come up in conversation because that is one of the chapters is about that dynamic, about being the answer giver. And um, and 
it was pretty liberating for them because they realized when they read it on a page that they're not alone in that fear and they're not alone, you know, with that, that perspective. But then it also didn't let them off the hook. It says you, you have to overcome that as a coach, you need to overcome that because your job's not to give the answer. And that's how we yeah. approached it. It's worked pretty well. Um, we're through the book and that group is, is, um, is really fired up and they're, they're practicing it. And I, you know, they're, they're experimenting with it as we, as we're moving forward. So they're, they're going to fall back and, you know, they're going to correct and each one will take a different path because they all have different struggles. But um, I would say that that's the way we chose to do it through education and skill building, I guess. Sure. Just a, 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 you've sort of part answered it, I think, but Sam Wagner has asked, uh, I don't know, he did, um, some of the training with you in pushing coaching closer to the work level what skills did you find most needing development to help the coaches be successful I think you've part answered that but is there any any gaps there in what you've said yeah there's a so I'm I'm going to hype another book but we use a there's a book called business writing with heart that is um it's really a communication book it's it's it, it focuses on writing in, at work, but it's really about relationship building communication. So you communicate in a way to build relationships versus tearing them down. So the struggle was, or, you know, the obstacle was their communication styles weren't building relationships with their team. So they weren't building trusting relationships with the learners as well as they could. And so therefore they weren't seeing that um, engagement. So one of the same group we started with the skills and from that book which are relationship building and that really started to um you know that was our experiment and that started to create an environment where they were much more open and they think about how they communicate inside of those coaching sessions and the um, the kata sessions and it really started to bond that team and and the, i'm talking there's a team of probably uh, 10 people now that are practicing actively um the coaching and improvement kata that are you know and so that's 10 percent of our workforce total but it's 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 a big portion of it's one whole department and they're really now yeah. kind of pulling the rest of the group along and they're jumping over into other departments and helping out so communication or lack of it uh, effective communication was probably our biggest obstacle for the coaches that were new uh, john what was the name of that book the reason i ask is i had a client ring me yesterday who, who needs development one-on-one -on -one with the supervisor, who um, his main, his, his head's in the right place and his mind goes in the right place, but it doesn't come out of his mouth well sometimes. <laughs> it's, so, yeah, it's, it's called Business Writing with Heart. Um, and I forgot who the author is. She's um, a communication expert, but I read the book uh, quite a while ago and I've it's really caught on here. There's individual groups going on now that are I'm not part of, but there's groups of employees that are reading it, doing the same thing, going through a chapter at a time, discussing how it impacts them in their role. And they talk about the challenges and it's been a really good learning environment, um, especially with remote. You can do that on Teams or, sure. um, or Zoom very easily. So, it, but I, I'll send you the author too, if you can't find that Oscar, but. I'll do a Google search after this. If I get in trouble, I'll email you. Thanks, John. Okay. Just as a point, and this is a leading question, but I want you to be very honest in your answer. Do you see, I know you've done job relations training, you guys. Do you see overlap between the four foundations and the stuff you've been talking about for the last five minutes, or do they tend to stand separate? I think they, I think there's definitely bleed over. I mean, there's, they definitely blend in. I, I what I've found is um, I'm not, I, I think I've backed off that it has to be, if I were to go through these now, Oscar, this model, I would change them from the tool, like job instruction, yeah. job methods. And I would, I would say, what are they trying to solve? Or what do you, what do you, yes. what are areas are those, you know? And the then skill. I would, yeah, the skill. And I, and what I would do after that is use whatever, tool works to it because not everybody learns you have different learning styles so not everybody can sit through a job relations training and apply it so we've we've been approaching it with um trying to find a resource that people can absorb and then doing it um, in a time back you know in a spaced out time period so that they they can build that skill and practice so we've used that book those two books i talked about um 
sure. in place a little bit of some of these job relations skills. So they don't technically follow that pattern. A lot of people find it really restrictive, but they do think of the same things, right? What's you know, yes? Here's the but fact. I think, I'm sorry. Go just ahead. just let me clarify what you're saying because I think it might be important. Is you would replace the word job relations with the skill of leading. You would replace job instruction with the skill of instructing. You'd replace job and methods with the skill of improving that's is that what you're saying yeah that's correct yeah good because i often say to a client this is what you need i don't really mind how you do it right here's one way of doing it jr or here's one way of doing it jr you pick the way i don't mind but i'm but what i'm telling you is you need it yeah you need to develop correct. these skills yeah and, and i and yeah. i think in in the the you know there's a um it, with the intergenerational workforce we have now too not every it, there's you have to let that flexibility happen because you know you take a person who's um, long in the workforce you know that's a baby boomer they're going to be fine with these patterns they're 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 they will conform to that but you take yes. a millennial or a gen z they're they're going to look at that or even me like a gen x i'm i'm a rebel i don't necessarily want to be told use this i just want to be told here's some skills you know you need to go use those to solve this problem develop those skills to solve whatever's in front of you so yeah it's interesting you say that because I can see that that you've you know become you speak very you speak about scientific thinking very naturally, um, uh, but you didn't four years ago when I first met you, right? <laughs> so, um, and how's that come about? Not through meeting me. I don't mean it in that way. How's that come about? It's about it's come about through a, a degree of rigidity about a pattern to develop that scientific thinking. So maybe that sits in behind, that is a almost a compulsory requirement. Let's, for, for, that's the bad word, but it's almost a compulsory requirement to, some, to a model like this that you have in front. Then how we develop those other skills, there's options, but this compulsory requirement of scientific thinking sits behind a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would totally yeah. agree with that. No worries. We're pretty close on time. I'll just see a question. Uh, so uh, one of the attendees has put up, thanks, Crystal. Business writing with heart is by Lynn Gartner Johnson. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Right. Thank you for that. John, I think that pulls us up now. We've got a couple of minutes left, but that's fine. Uh, but as I've said before, really appreciate your time and, um, and the work that you're doing, making uh, something we started, or you started, four or five years ago, uh, turn into reality. So appreciate your time and reflections and have a really, really good Christmas and a happy new year. And uh, hopefully we'll see you soon in the face-to-face. -face. All right, thank you. You have a happy holidays as well. And I appreciate the opportunity to share what we've got going on. Um, it's, it's fun to watch for sure. Yeah, good. And anyone who's still, a, you know, people are dropping off now, but if you need, if you would like to hear more from John or contact John, I know he's very willing in that area. Just email Lean Frontiers, Skylar, ask her for John's email address. And I know he um, is always willing to share his experiences. Thanks, John. Have a, have a, a good afternoon. Right, thank you, John and Oscar. Um, just a quick right. reminder, you will receive a recording um, or a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours. And everyone, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Ayla. See ya. Thank you. Bye, bro. Bye. Thanks, John.